Hi, it's Jan Beta and I'm still working on the Amiga 1000 that you have probably seen me uh, working on in the previous video. Today I am going to look at the circuit board again that I recapped in the last episode. Uh, I'm also going to look at the power supply again which could use maybe a new fan because this one while it works pretty nicely um, it gets louder the longer it runs. So in, in the beginning you feel like it's really uh, quiet and then it develops like a grinding sound after a while which is pretty unpleasant. So we're going to see um, if we can replace that. Then I'm also going to look at the floppy disk drive and uh, see if I can get that to work a bit better. It probably needs some lubrication and it could use some cleaning on the heads probably. Um, as these drives do after a while. And then I'm also going to do some repairs on the case because we got some broken off uh, little hinges and stuff and uh, we're going to see about that in this episode too. So without further ado let's just get right into it. I found some peculiar things about the main board that I'd like to share and uh, address. In particular, found this capacitor, which is C166, uh, which is a bypass capacitor or decoupling capacitor for the 5 volt supply that goes into all these RAM chips. And yeah, look at this, it's just floating, it's just not connected on this, uh, in this uh, through hole, hole. And I assume because there's no reason why you would... Uh, this is basically just for cleaning up the voltage supply to the RAM chips, which absolutely makes sense, because the cleaner the, the power supply that goes into the RAM chips, the better, the more reliable they are going to work. Um, this probably didn't uh, get placed correctly by the pick-and-place machine or whatever machines they were using at the time, or probably... Uh, lot less sophisticated than what they use today. Um, that probably didn't get into the hole because the lag is still very long. I can't see any uh, signs of this being ever soldered. And uh, yeah, it just did only it only get, got stuck in this hole and uh, got through the wave soldering bath and this connection was never made. And it still works because the voltage supplied directly from the power supply. Probably there's some more filtering in there um, by some electrolytics. This is just to filter some high frequency ripple and uh, filter it close to where the voltage actually is used by the ICs. That's uh, pretty common to do that. Um, probably the supply was clean enough for this machine to work flawlessly. Maybe it had some unwanted guru meditations uh, from time to time, I don't know. But uh, as far as I could see in my uh, very brief testing, this machine works flawlessly. So, yeah. What I'm going to do is to resolder this and just uh, make the connection that never was. <laughs> there actually, actually are quite a few spots where the soldering is not very good. Um, and this one, you can see that the solder didn't flow all the way through. Uh, this gets into a, a wave soldering bath. Uh, basically it's bathing in solder, in melted solder. And then the wonder of physics, uh, capillary, sucks the solder in through the holes and um, basically sucks it onto the top layer, which it didn't in this case and in some other cases on the board. So the first thing I'm going to do is to go over this board visually and uh, see if I can re-solder some of the connections that uh, haven't been soldered correctly and of course uh, place this little capacitor where it belongs. <laughs> So the first thing to address is this uh, capacitor. I'm going to try and suck out the solder with uh, some solder wick and I'm uh, going to put the lag in there and then I'm adding some new solder from the other side of the board. I think that's the most reasonable way to do this. Um, I might add some fresh solder actually before I suck it out because that 
probably works better because I have some fresh flux in there. That's uh, peculiar that this this stuff happened, uh, I guess, more often back in the day than it does today because the machines, like basically robots placing the components, were not as perfect. Or they were placed by humans. <laughs> and as we all know, humans are not very perfect. Most of them. Some of them are. Yeah, the length of the leg is actually quite perfect. I'm just going to clip it a bit anyway. So it's not quite 110% very nicely aligned, but uh, yeah, nothing on this board really is. There it is. Should make nice contact, and that's the main purpose of this. <laughs> There's quite some solar residue here. I, I wonder if they uh, replaced some of the RAM chips at a later point or something like that. They are different brands, but there's so many replaced ones that that wouldn't make sense. I guess they were on the from factory like this, like different brands mixed. So and as for the other imperfections, I'm just going to go over the board and I'll just add some solder here and there. Okay, this is going to be quite boring. I'm just looking at spots where the solder doesn't didn't go through the board very nicely. And just adding some additional flux and some additional solder. So everything is soldered in place nicely again. I think I want to re-solder some of the connectors. Because the connectors are always very common points of failure because they are under constant mechanical stress. Um, with the leaded solder of the day it's not that bad actually, I guess, but uh, still going to add some fresh soda, some leaded fresh soda. You should always use the same kind of solder, or like uh, same leaded or unleaded, not the exact same brand or anything like that. Um, usually, what if you if you want to be sure to make it perfect, you should remove the old solder completely which I almost never do because I'm quite sure that this is uh, very similar to this solder. It's going to flow fine. Resoldering all them connections. Or connectors. Connectorps. As Louis Rossman said, you can never have too much flux. Well, you can, if you don't clean it up afterwards. Yeah, this looks better than before, actually. Maybe this was made on a mon Monday. <laughs> this board. Okay, perfect. Cleaning up the mess a bit. Actually need to refill my isopropanol bottle. Use too much of it for washing my hand. Which actually caused the... I, I did that in one of the last videos, uh, like as a little joke, washing my hand with isopropanol, which caused quite some discussion in the comments, of course, because nobody got it uh, as a joke. And people said, like, uh, stuff like... 99.9% .9 isopropanol won't do much against uh, viruses. And that's actually true. 60 to 70% works much better. So you should uh, actually not use pure isopropanol to disinfect your hands because it doesn't work that well. Uh, mix it with distilled water and it works better. <laughs> and don't trust Electronics Tinker YouTube with uh, any virological advice, <laughs> really. So I'm actually quite satisfied with uh, how this turned out now. Let's see if it actually still works. Which would of course be a plus.
I think it actually flickers less. <laughs> okay, would be cool if it started up, actually. Yes, it does. Very nice. Okay, so the next problem I want to address is this uh, fan that gets noisy pretty quickly after turning on the power supply. It just runs on uh, AC voltage 208 to 240 volts, 50 or 60 hertz, 6 or 5 watts. This is a very old school, uh, like mains powered fan and uh, 8 inch. This is actually metal, die-cast metal stuff. This is a really uh, good industrial-grade fan, I guess. Uh, but still, as this is uh, from 1986, it got a bit noisy. You can probably re-lubricate these and make them work better again, I guess. You can also still get uh, mains voltage replacement fans. Um, this is, I think this is 38 millimeters. Yeah, this is exactly 38 millimeter fan, 3.8 centimeters. This is 8 centimeters by, uh, 8 centimeters wide and, and high and uh, 3.8 centimeters wide or deep rather. So uh, you can get fans with these exact measurements. It has some some distance to the outer case, so you can definitely use a fan that's not quite as deep, uh, like a 25 millimeter one. They, these are much easier to get these days, I, I believe. Um, you can get these from some sellers if you want to go mains voltage fan and keep uh, close to the original. I'm going to try to fit something else while uh, keeping this intact basically to be able to retrofit it in case uh, the other thing doesn't work <laughs> or if I want to go back to um, completely vanilla Amiga 1000. That's kind of the plan with this machine to, is to keep it as vanilla as possible while still uh, making it a really useful machine for everyday use. That's kind of my intention with this restoration. So I got this. If you have been following this channel for a while, um, you probably know that I'm a fan of the Noctua fans, uh, pun intended. And uh, these are, while they are pretty expensive compared to other brands or no-name fans, um, I found that these are the best fans you can get these days on in the on the consumer level so um, this is like a 14 euros I believe fan which I think it's worth it for a machine uh, like this rare and uh, yeah if you if you have watched my other some of my other Amiga videos I also put one of these uh, different diameter in my Amiga 2000 and it works absolutely no problem problems at all it's really silent um, they have this uh, unique brown uh, beige color. Yeah, we're not going to see that from the outside or yeah, at least not if you don't look very, very closely and know what to look for. These are usually very silent. This is a 12 volt fan, which is the main difference to this old fan, which is a mains powered fan. So we are, as this is a power supply that supplies, uh, among other things, 12 volts. We can probably find a way to power this from this power supply and uh, this is going to have better airflow and uh, this is going to be a lot more silent than the old original fan. So yeah, uh, let's try and fit this into the power supply or onto the power supply in this case. So and of course I have to crack the power supply open again for this purpose. I'm happy to do that. Did that already in the last episode of this restoration. Actually, I did that twice because I had to order uh, this large capacitor. I didn't have that in stock. So this is actually pretty convenient, I think. Uh, we can just disconnect the old fan. Is connected with this nice uh, Molex style connector and uh, then we have to get 
ourselves some 12 volts from somewhere probably we can get it from somewhere close to where the uh, voltages actually go to the main board of the computer and yeah just grab us some 12 volts there and solder on a connector for our fan and this is just screwed on so we should just be able to remove these screws here we can take this whole thing off and then we have to we only have to take care that it blows in the correct uh, direction which should be outwards yeah so okay powering this on okay so our 12 volts should be on the orange one it's not powering up uh, because we don't have a load connected I guess Okay, and I just downloaded the actual schematics for the power supply. I don't know if you can see it very well, but here is uh, the color coding for the connector and it says purple is minus 5 as we have also measured red are 2 plus 5 uh, like lines. Uh, the gray one is the tick signal, which is a timing signal provided by the old Amiga power supplies. Uh, same with the Amiga 2000 actually. Black is ground, orange is plus 12. So we need to um, tap into the um, orange line there, which we are. Yeah, we need the orange line and one of the black lines actually. Hmm, so I actually want to do this kind of properly, and there's no way we can uh, solder to the top part here. So I guess there's a small gap underneath uh, the circuit board it's like um, yeah there's there's a small gap to prevent high voltage from uh, getting to the case I guess and uh, we are going to run a wire we are going to solder wires from the bottom side and run them out on the front here somewhere to have a nice place to connect the fan I guess uh, yeah I think that's the way to do this I guess I'm just, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, get the circuit board out again, which is kind of a pain, but yeah, it works. I've done that several times now. Um, going to solder to the orange, where the orange wire connects and where one of the black wires connects. Okay, so here's our connector and we want to solder to the orange one, this is plus, and one of the ones next to it, which is the negative. So I always like to mark stuff uh, because I easily get confused. Um, about where to solder and things like that. So um, we need to tap these two and run a wire to this side here where the fan is going to be located. Actually let's inspect the fan first. There's a couple of things that come with these and there's a couple of cables that could be very handy in this case. Uh, very nice. <laughs> as, as you can see, this is like a 2.5 centimeter fan, so it's a lot uh, lower profile. But it's still going to have a significant airflow, I think. Yeah, it's going to be located like this. Very nice. And we have like an extension cable, that's kind of what I wanted. Yeah, we are going to use this cable, actually. So let's see what kind of length are we talking about. Um, this side should come up here. It should go somewhere here. So we need something like maybe this. We don't need that much cable. Sorry, Noctua, I'm going to have to cut your nice, nicely sleeved cable here. At least the, the sleeve. <laughs> How do I do this in an intelligent way, like so? Yeah, there we go. 
Okay, and as you can see, there's four lines. I have to figure out the, the pinout again. Okay, so here's the official Noctua site, Noctua.at. It's actually uh, an Austrian brand, not Australian. <laughs> um, yellow is plus 12 and black is ground. Blue and green are the PWM and uh, rounds per minute speed. So we don't need those. So I'm going to cut the blue and the green. And I'm going to strip the yellow and the black. And then I'm going to solder them on to these points here. And we're going to have a nice, removable 12 volt fan, <laughs> hopefully, in the end. Actually going to add quite some solder to the old points here. Okay, that should be it. Okay, it should be poking out here. Yeah, very nice. Okay, that actually works pretty well. Okay, so I actually ran this uh, like it's running like so, in, in like a kind of a curve, I, I guess. And it comes out here in this corner where it doesn't obstruct the actual fan in the end. Uh, probably going to use a cable tie or something to keep it away from the fan. But we're going to add some more cabling to this, so yeah. Uh, let me screw this back in and see if it actually fits still with the screws. Why didn't they use like regular screws for this? <laughs> hmm. Okay, it seems to be five millimeter nut, which is of course the smallest I have is a six. Yeah, this doesn't fit correctly, but it's better than with pliers. <laughs> Interestingly, this whole compartment here is just empty. It's just wires running from the main socket here, or the uh, IEC socket. Um, very interesting. I, w I was uh, think I, I was kind of prepared to see some kind of uh, filtering going on here, but there isn't. So, yeah. Uh, I think I'm just going to end up using normal screws for this. Uh, put the washers like uh, Phillips screws or something and put the washers back on. Uh, yeah, but I think we can just mount our fan on here and are basically good to go. By the way, this is a really heavy metal fan. It has a bit of play. So that's probably why it starts being noisy after a while. You could probably re-lubricate this and make it run properly again. I kind of uh, think that this is not the quietest fan in the world in the end. Probably, pro probably pretty low vibrations because it's so heavy. But this is uh, going to be better in the end. Oh. So we needed to blow out. It has some markings here. 
blows out and turns in this direction. So it needs to go like so. So the cable is going to run through the opening where the original cable went and we are making sure that the fan is blowing outwards. So it's going something like this. It's going to be cable tied here. Maybe maybe another point somewhere. But um, yeah, I think I'm just going to find some regular screws that fit this. So I'm actually going to use these long M3 screws that I've found. Yeah, this should be perfect in the end, I guess. Let's see. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, that went pretty smoothly. I guess it's time to try if this actually works before I cable tie it in place and stuff like that. Woohoo! Actually turns at full speed, of course. <laughs> Maybe we want to bring it down a bit, but we have like a silencer cable for that. Low noise. Can use that. Guess that's what we're going to do. Because this blows a lot more air than the old fan actually, so we don't really need that much air. Okay, I have the low noise adapter thingy in place. And it's actually not that much lower. Not that convinced of this fan so far. But it's definitely sil more silent than the old one. Still not quite, it could be a bit more silent still for my taste. And it definitely moves more air than the old fan, so that's good. We're going to have decent cooling at least for the machine, which is a plus. Yeah, shouldn't run this power supply for too long without a load actually. Okay, so let's see if this thing still powers on with the new fan. And it actually does. Very nice. So it turns out I would have been better off with buying another version of this fan, which is not the uh, controlled version, PWM version, but uh, the version called FLX, which, as it turns out, runs a bit slower than this in general and should be a tiny bit quieter. It's just a couple of RPMs, uh, so... I kind of want to replace this with another version and I didn't get the FLX version which I which is a three prong version of this without the PWM controlled uh, speed. I went and got the ULN version which is ultra low noise and which should be even uh, less noisy and run a lot slower. And it, I think it has more blades so um, the sound will be more pleasant and more uh, perceived more quiet. So I, I am going to replace the old uh, PWM NFA8 version with the NFA8 ULN version, which should be a lot quieter. And I have to disassemble the whole thing again because this has only three uh, contacts and is wired up in a different way. So yeah. Let's do that. Uh, sorry for being uh, kind of 
uh, silly with this. This is, don't get me wrong, this is fine and this will be quiet enough for most people, at least with the, with the um, low noise adapter, but I kind of want to do a job that I consider perfect and I'm, I have plenty of uses for the other fans so this is not going to waste or anything. They are pretty expensive fans, still like them because the quality is just awesome in these and uh, generally they, they are really quiet and have like, you get all the, the stuff with them like the adapters and uh, extension cables and stuff which makes this a really handy fan for a future project. <laughs> Maybe I'll put it in my streaming PC or something like that. Okay, now I'm just really quickly going to disassemble this again. Yeah, let me just let me just see which which connections we have. So this actually should connect to the uh, PWM adapter, I think. Let's double check that. Maybe I don't have to disassemble this all. Yay, so it turns out that on the three pin Noctua fans, uh, the red and the black is uh, 12 volt red and black is ground. And they match the four pin adapters. So we can just plug this into the uh, female part of this, or the male part rather, with the pins. <laughs> and it's going to work. It's going to be provided with 12 volt in the right configuration. So um, the only way this three pin thing goes into the uh, four pin socket is the right way that it gets 12 volts. Nice win. <laughs> so don't have to take apart the whole power supply again. And this also shows that I'm not very experienced with uh, PC stuff at all. <laughs> like the the pin configuration on fans and that I can just plug a three pin. I would have would have guessed so that I can plug a three pin uh, fan into a four pin connector, but I didn't know for sure. So learned something new today. Maybe you did too. <laughs> okay, so this should be Okay, and I was wrong about uh, the ultra low noise one having less blades or anything like that. They just look absolutely the same. They even have the same uh, little engravings on the uh, on the fans. Yeah, but this says PWM and it is a four prong connector and the other one is three pin connector. So we are going to use this one. In the same orientation, I would guess. Yes, the airflow goes outside. I don't know if you can see. There's a little arrow for the airflow on this as well, of course. So we can put it like in here. Now we should put it like so. Okay, got the board back in place and uh, I have not screwed this cover on yet because I want to see how uh, silent the fan really is. Not at all. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> because someone, something... Okay, and actually this cable here caught the fan, I think. Okay, second try. I'm just going to cover this so I won't get shocked immediately. There we go. Okay, now that is remarkably silent. You can't probably hear it at all. I can barely hear it from here and I'm really close to it. And there's still, I would say this is about uh, the same airflow as with the original fan. Let me try this without the low noise adapter. That will probably be the perfect, perfect thing to do. 
Okay, so now it should still be really silent and have a bit more airflow. Yeah, that's perfect. I think I can absolutely live with that. That's really... I don't know if you can... I can still barely hear it from here. And it's going to be in a case and, and better. This is all going to be screwed down and cable tied and stuff. So it's not going to vibrate as much. This is good. Nice. Okay. So uh, I can recommend this fan. <laughs> and you can use it with the low uh, noise adapter. That's... Um, Perceived still enough airflow, but kind of like like this. There's more airflow like this, which is probably a good idea to cool the machine Because the fan cools the whole machine basically nice. Okay fan is done finally <laughs> So here's one thing that I have to rectify from the last video. Uh, I stand corrected. Uh, somebody in the comments pointed out I was saying this was an original Motorola 68000 processor. But it's not. This is not the Motorola logo. I didn't look close enough. I was not able to 100% uh, identify the little logo. Looks a bit like the Rockwell logo, who made uh, a lot of the MOS uh, chips as a second manufacturer. But I think uh, the person in the comments, I sorry I couldn't find your comment, uh, but thanks for pointing that out. It seems that these uh, EF68000 uh, chips were made by Thompson actually. So it might be an early Thompson logo. I couldn't find that, but think. That makes sense. Another person in the comments, I can't remember the name of, of course, because that video got a lot of comments. Uh, thank you for that, by the way. I probably am going to answer most of them. Somebody asked what is under here, and it's just a couple of logic chips, I think, and a crystal oscillator. So I'm not quite sure about this, but I think this is part of the um, video output. Probably that's why it's uh, encased in this RF shield so it doesn't uh, get any interference and it also has the uh, 28.37516 megahertz uh, chip uh, oscillator which is I think uh, the PAL frequency generator basically. <laughs> I could try polishing these but I don't really care that much. They're just, it's just, it's not rusted. It's just uh, the the chrome finish is a bit corroded, I guess. Could polish these, but I'm, I'm not going to go that far. Oh, it actually has some indentations to allow for the capacitors and the power connection to fit. Nice. So I think that's it uh, for the main board for the moment. Maybe I'll have to go back to this at some point and do some more work on it. But for now it seems like this works. And the power supply should also work for a while now. It got uh, new uh, decent cooling that is silent and uh, new capacitors and new voltage regulators. So that should be good to go for another couple of decades, hopefully. As for the board, uh, you can always be like out of luck with these old uh, chips. Some of those are not very high quality uh, from a production point of view, but hey, they held up this long, so hopefully they're going to last a, a little bit longer still. And uh, the processor at least is very sturdy generally. I've never seen one of those fail yet. Okay, let's dig a bit deeper into the disk drive and clean that and re-lubricate that. I think that makes sense after all these years. First of all, we have to get the whole uh, shielding off, which I think there are just four screws on the sides here, and the drive itself should slide out. Yeah, there we go. 
Yeah, it's screwed down with two little screws on each side. I need a smaller screwdriver. Okay, now that comes off and gives us access to the heads and the rail. Okay. So this part, there's the heads underneath here. There's two heads. You can see the bottom one there, the little white thing with the black stripe. And there's another one on the top. So because it's a uh, double-sided disk drive, obviously. Very advanced again for the time. Yeah, and there's a little, there's a little rail that the head can move on. I don't know if you can see that. It's like the the metal rod that's here underneath here. And you can lubricate that a bit because that is uh, the axis of movement that the head has. And yeah, the rest of it should probably be fine. There's a lot of dust in this front part here. I don't want to take it apart completely. Just want to lubricate some. There's this like the, the locking mechanism where the disc slides in. I just want to remove some of the old gunk and uh, put some new silicon grease in there and lubricate the rail and clean the heads a bit. I'm not going to go overboard with this because they are really easy to destroy <laughs> um, if you are too harsh with these old drives. They're like, um, yeah, be kind to them basically because they are pretty old. And obviously this is another Japanese product, Tamagawa Saiki 1286. December 86 probably. 12 volt motor. So what I usually do is to um, grab some Q-tips or cotton swabs, depending on how you want to call them, and uh, clean all the parts I can see that are dirty. This actually, there's like a layer of dirt on this, like very fine dust. So I'm just going to clean that for a bit, everything I can see. And especially in this front part, of course, because that was open for years and years. This has probably not been cleaned in a long time. And then I'm, I'm just going to go over this again, look at that, with some isopropanol to fully clean it and uh, clean off the old lubricant and in the end uh, re-lubricate it and uh, clean the heads as the very last step. I could use compressed air but I don't have any left. So here's an interesting bit I learned about these drives a while back which might be helpful to some. Um, the older versions often have like mechanical little switches to determine if a disc is inserted, if it's uh, right protected, these are just like little rods that switch close the connection uh, mechanically. So um, if these are stuck or broken, you often get uh, disc drives that don't read discs or have like intermittent read write errors or stuff like that. <laughs> Had that, that on a couple of old Amiga drives uh, in particular. Later versions often have like uh, light sensors and stuff like that. Uh, like a diode and a sensor and determining, determining if there is a hole in the disk or not that way. But older versions often have switches. And those can, yeah, they are basically, they can make bad contact or they can get physically stuck mechanically. Uh, so it's always a good idea to check those as well. I'm going to clean the area really thoroughly. Yeah, and as I said, I'm out of compressed air, so I'm doing something you shouldn't necessarily do and just using uh, my breath to blow into this. It's of course not the best practice because you introduce a lot of moisture. But that's what I have basically at the moment, so I'm sorry. You should, if you have compressed air or even an air compressor, like air in a can or an air compressor, you should use that, obviously. Also, you shouldn't blow into cartridges. <laughs> I had actually had a discussion with somebody about that and he said, yeah, it's fine. And I've seen like cartridges like NES, Super Nintendo or anything like that, Mega Drive, uh, Master System cartridges that people are used to, if they are not making good contact, people used to blow into the uh, contacts. And that way you're introducing a lot of moisture into those. And moisture 
causes a lot of corrosion. And I've seen cartridges that yeah, basically were not, not working anymore because they were so corroded from the moisture that had accumulated inside over the years. That's not desirable. <laughs> it's also not nice to clean them. So I'm removing the old lubricant from the sides here as well as I can. That's, that's really a hard and hardened. It's not gonna work very well anymore. Okay, let's try and get to this rail there. Although I don't see any lubricant on there at all at this point. But there might still be remnants of that on there. It's always better to just completely clean it off. Otherwise, this is pretty clean. The front part was pretty filthy, but the rest of it looks uh, nearly as good as new, probably because it was hidden under a gigantic uh, RF shield all these years. Okay, now I want to introduce some new lubricant. I'm just using silicon grease. Uh, you can use lithium grease. There are there are special metal uh, greases for metal parts rubbing against metal parts and metal parts rubbing against plastic parts and stuff like that. I've made very good uh, experiences with uh, this stuff. You only need a little bit of it. So now we need a bit more for these parts here. Put some on the moving parts basically. Let's put a disc inside it. Yeah, smooth as silk, I'd say. Yeah, that's very nice. Okay, that's good enough for me. Let's clean the heads. And for that, of course, taking the disc out again, I'm just using a fresh Q-tip, basically soaking it in alcohol. And I'm just going to insert it here. You don't want to, um, you can like lift it lightly, slightly. You don't want to do that too far. I can actually move that bad, uh, back, that works better. You don't want to lift it too far because you are going to, um, this is basically spring loaded, so you, you don't want to wear out the spring too much. Otherwise it won't make good contact with the disc. So then you go with a dry Q-tip or the dry side. Just carefully. Sometimes there are like little electrolytic capacitors on these usually or little tantalum capacitors or capacitors of various kinds. Sometimes these fail and uh, give you like weird behavior from the drives. So I'm not going to replace those because it appears to work fine. Um, but that's a common fault actually in these drives and uh, some later ones have these uh, dreaded SMD uh, capacitors on there as well that fail a lot. Uh, recently had to replace one of those in my Amiga 1200 that had a leaky cap on there and, and the drive didn't work at all and after replacing the cap it worked fine. So that's a common fault in these drives. Uh, worth noting. In this case they seem to be fine but if you get weird behavior from a drive and have cleaned the heads and lubricated the rails, that's a very common thing to watch out for. There we go. So, actually, let's turn it. Yes. So, as we've seen in the last episode of this restoration, by the way, if you haven't watched that, it makes sense to watch that first. I'm going to link that in the corner there. Uh, this, this is still there, but it's missing a piece. Um, so, we can... Actually, it goes like this, I think. So, we can put it here. And if it is, if the whole drive is in the case, uh, it also works to an extent, 
but it has to sit just right and it always falls down and locks up so the drive won't uh, register the disc because it's not all the way in. Um, we need to repair this, I guess. Okay, so here's the part um, and you can see this little part here and I think a similar part should be attached to the bottom here so that it grabs uh, or it snaps in from both sides with these uh, little grippy things and that's completely missing so I can't just glue it back on or anything like that. Um, I consider just gluing this onto the actual uh, switching part here or the, the mechanical connection that uh, ejects the disc but could also maybe try to make this. Okay, so here's what I want to try today. I have some cyanoacrylate based glue, uh, also known as super glue or I don't know, magic glue probably. In German it's Sekundenkleber because it dries in a matter of seconds. Uh, that's what it's called here. And baking soda, regular baking soda. And what you can actually do, you can mix baking soda with cyanoacrylate glue and build up structures that are bonding to uh, this ABS, alleged, allegedly ABS plastic and make a very sturdy structure and then you can like file it uh, the way you want it. I want to clean this up and wash it thoroughly and then try to build this little uh, clip that is missing. Okay, I'm going to thoroughly clean this with some IPA so there's no fat, grease, whatever on there, dirt, grime. So I don't know exactly how the part is going to look like in the end but I, I guess it's just more or less like a little uh, clip that goes here. Just a copy of this basically. So we need some, some fine baking soda. Some people probably have done uh, this with a credit card before, but I didn't. So I'm opening the glue, put a little drop on here. There we go. And then we should try and put a bit of baking soda on there. Yeah, and it immediately forms a very hard layer. That's what I hoped for. Nice, that works really nicely. Okay. So we should be able to build up some structure here. This is fun. <laughs> this is actually a lot of fun. Look at that, and we already worked our way. That's really nice. That works pretty well, actually. <laughs> Let's use a bit more. You can always go a bit further, I guess, and file it down later. Actually, added a very sturdy structure to the tip of my screwdriver as well <laughs> but that's like the one I, I that's like a pretty beaten up one I always use to mix glue and stuff so it's okay it's gonna be all right that looks pretty nice already and it's yeah it's really well bonded actually warm it gets warm with the uh, reaction whatever the exact chemical reaction is but this is a really solid piece of material right there. Nice. Very nice. That's a nice trick. I'm going to use that in the future. Maybe you do too now. It's really easy. Now I can just file it down to the size I need it in. Yeah, nice. 
Okay, so here's what I got. Maybe that's it already. F try to file like a little, little uh, hook in there. It's not elastic, so that's probably might be a problem. But the rest of the plastic is elastic, so maybe we can get it in there. Let's try. Yay! Okay, that's not... It's not perfect. Still, maybe I want to add a dab of hot glue or something. But look at that! It's in there and we have replaced that little hingy thing there. I should add a little a tad more again. So it grips tiny bit better. I think I filed down a tiny bit too much. Okay, that's actually on there pretty nicely now. So look at that. We fixed it pretty much. Could of course always use some more glue but it's on here pretty nicely so probably just going to leave it like that. And uh, just to make it clear, of course there's better there's better glue than this and there's better filler is what it's called for uh, filling gaps with uh, cyanoacrylate based glue. Um, I am going to try some other stuff but that's the stuff I have uh, I had lying around here that was pretty much a pretty spontaneous idea and it worked beautifully for this. So if you only have baking soda and a cheap cyanoacrylate uh, glue from the supermarket it's going to work reasonably well, but of course there is professional stuff uh, that is used for model making and things like that. And there also is uh, a so-called activator, which uh, makes this set a lot quicker, so you can work a lot more precise. And uh, yeah, it's also going to make a much sturdier connection if you use the uh, better cyanoacrylate glue and the... Uh, filler which is I, I believe it's a finer powder even than uh, baking soda so if you want to do something serious uh, use that stuff if you have the opportunity to get that just wanted to point that out because it got pointed out to me after I tweeted about this <laughs> thanks again for pointing it out unnamed person who pointed it out to me <laughs> As for the rest of the case, I considered doing some light retro brighting on it, but yeah, um, it is pretty much the original color, so I pretty much don't need to do any of that. It has some stains and scratches and stuff, but I won't do... I, I guess there's not much I can do about that because it has a texture to it, and if I sand it down or anything like that, um, I would destroy the original texture, which is something I definitely don't want to do. Uh, you can pretty much see the original color here, because this was covered, and this is uh, how much it has yellowed. You can also see, let me zoom in on that, this is the spot where the warranty sticker was uh, that I removed in the first part of the video series, and you can barely make out that it's a little bit brighter there. This originally, this isn't white, it's a beige color, like the uh, classic computer color, basically, uh, that most later desktops in the 90s had. Um, it is a bright beige color and that's what it still is. So it's pretty much, it's pretty much the original color, that's what I wanted to point out. Also, here's my A1010 drive that I did some retro bright on and this is um, still the original color pretty much the original color too, now, after retro brighting. And yeah, it is the same color, so I consider this non-retro bright worthy, I guess. <laughs> so I said in the last video that retro brighting makes plastic more brittle, which is not necessarily true. Uh, some people even claim it makes plastic more elastic again, because it adds uh, moisture to the plastic, back to the plastic. Uh, I, after doing a lot of research and trying retro writing myself, I can't really 
verify one or the other. So I'd rather be safe than sorry with this. And what I'm going to do is to use some glue to fix these hinges. Pretty much leave the front side and the top side and the uh, bottom side as it is. I am going to try to retrobrite the back side, I think. So this back part of the case, which is just, uh, it slides into the uh, case, is the only part that's significantly yellowed. So I am going to try to retrobrite this for a bit with my usual setup with uh, peroxide cream and with my uh, grow light, full spectrum light, which isn't really a full spectrum light, but it worked for me, so uh, it does some significant heating of the plastics in my setup. You are going to see, I'm going to show you my setup again, uh, which I've used numerous times now with uh, great success, mostly. So there is a little part with a crack in it. I'm going to glue that back together. And I'm going to try to uh, glue the little parts that have broke, broken off from this part. Let's do that before retrobriting, I guess. So here's the back part of the back plate thing. There's our crack. And I want to use this stuff, which basically is a, another model making glue, uh, glue that uh, basically is acetone based, if I understood it correctly. And it uh, welds plastic together by dissolving it. And then you have like, it's, it's just, uh, dissolves the plastic and melts it into each other chemically, basically. So I'm going to try this stuff uh, on this little part here, on the back plate. By the way, this is the original color pretty much, and this is the yellowed color. You can also see that the original color is uh, the same color as the front panel, so it is the original color. It is not significantly yellowed. Uh, I am going to try to put some of this stuff into these cracks and see if that welds it together again. And if that works nicely, I'm going to try it on some other parts in the case as well. So yeah, let me see. I kind of just want to put it in here. Maybe it should go from this side because the cracks open to this side. Okay, so I want this in the cracks. Wow, and already, I think it already works, actually. <laughs> already dissolved the plastic. Very nice, okay. This should be pretty sturdy after a couple of minutes already. So something like this. Okay, I'm going to let this sit for a while. And while I wait for the glue to set, I want to try and replace this little uh, broken off edge of the top case with uh, the same stuff with the baking soda we used for the floppy disk drive. Okay, let's try this again. And I'm just alternating uh, baking soda and glue here. Seem to have done the trick on the other stuff pretty nicely. <laughs> of course, you don't want to touch it. <laughs> I'm building a little structure. Yeah, and I think that might be it already. Okay, so here's what we got. We have to file it a bit. But it definitely filled the gap there. It's, it's shining through a bit, so... And this is a really sturdy material, actually. So for little repairs like this, it works beautifully. And I'm just using one of my nail files again, because I really like those.
Okay, not too bad. We filled this little piece with our filler material, which is baking soda and uh, cyanoacrylic glue. Um, here's the piece that's flapping around, so we have to glue that back. So let's check out this piece in the meantime that had some time to dry. Yeah, and it's already it's bonded pretty nicely, I guess. We can just try cyanoacrylic, I guess. That should bond this nicely. Maybe that's the way I want to go. Yeah, let's just try that. Just need to put some in there. This should work. Okay, definitely better than before. <laughs> That's going to do. Yeah, we're going to let this sit for a while and see how it turns out. Definitely better than before already, uh, this whole piece. So, and it's only in the back side, so we're not going to see much of it in case it looks ugly. <laughs> I am going to have to reconstruct some of these, which clip on the front panel. And some of them are broken. This one is broken off completely, this one. But I still have the pieces, so I want to reconstruct that. And this one is, uh, yeah, some of them are damaged. This one in particular. I want to try and glue that back together. I want to fill this gap with some uh, baking soda, I guess. It's probably the best, best option I have. And just going to leave it in place. I guess. Yeah, but it's already it's already bonding quite nicely. Okay, and we're just going to try to reconstruct this. I think the best option for this would be to go with the acetone based glue because we only have little pieces and um, try to dissolve the plastic and then get it back together in a way. Yeah, that should probably, maybe that's the best option. I am not an expert on glues and it's probably the wrong thing to try this on. <laughs> but um, at least we're not going to make it any worse, I guess. Just going to leave this to dry for a while and put on the other piece, I guess, and then try to piece it together, piece by piece. <laughs> um, I think this, this needs like five minutes to set so that I can work with it. So I'm just going to give it five minutes. Some minutes later. Yeah, and it's definitely on. So let's put the other piece on. Uh, that should be attached to both sides. Really, let's see if I can manage to do that. That's a bit more complicated. And probably should. Uh, hey, okay. That worked better than I thought. Let's put some more. On there. Okay, now that has to sit for another little while, and then I think we might even be done with the case. As for the retro brighting of this back part, which actually made a quite quite a sturdy connection there, I am going to use my usual uh, cream oxidant, which is um, hydrogen peroxide cream, twelve percent. 
that I'm going to link in below this video in the video description again so you can get this exact stuff. There's others that work, this has worked for me before so I just um, stuck with this. Um, and yeah, I am using a brush to evenly put it on here basically after just putting a generous amount on here. Like so, you only need a thin layer to work. Well, this brush is pretty dry, dried up. <laughs> okay, probably I'm going to need some more because the brush is so dry. Um, I'm just going to cover this. This is such a small piece that I can maybe just use actual sun. Even though I'm in the northern part of Germany where the sun doesn't shine that much. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to put this in the sun and let it sit there for some hours. And every half hour or so I'm just going to massage the cream around on it a bit so it doesn't streak and make uh, like the marbling effect or anything like that. I've had quite good results with this method. Um, didn't use the sun that often, but yeah, of course it works. I You can use like a new UV light or heat alone seems to work as well, but doesn't seem to work as fast. The best thing is still um, bright sunlight, like a high noon kind of sunlight in summer. Uh, like the 8-bit guy famously does all the time, but he's in Texas where there's a lot of sun. <laughs> and yeah, that works for him really quickly. So if you don't have as much sun, use uh, artificial lights. There's uh, several options for that. I use a grow light that I'm also going to link in the description again, usually, which works reasonably well for me. There we go. It's only the evening sun, but maybe it does something at least. <laughs> Being the impatient person that I am and with the sun uh, slightly setting, I just went on and used my retro brighting box which has a UV grow light on top and uh, the box is like lined in aluminum foil so uh, the light reflects from all sides and I'm just going in there every half hour and Turning this off and then I just go in here, take it apart and slightly massage around the peroxide cream and slightly change the position so it gets evenly lighted <laughs> from all sides or from, from all uh, angles in this case because only the one side is yellowed and I'm just going to do this until I see uh, this is back to its original color or very close to its original color again and uh, the trick for me to not get any streaking or any um, like marbling effects is really to go in every half an hour and to rub the cream around uh, underneath the foil so there are no bubbles or anything that uh, can lead to discoloration. Yeah, I've shown this before in other videos so I'm not going to do, do a very uh, thorough explanation of this again. I'm going to link a video where you can see me doing this in detail in the corner. Okay, so this took a bit longer than I anticipated. It's the next day and I had this running for quite some hours now. I don't really know for how long, but it got a lot better now and it seems to have been um, coming to a, a halt kind of thing. It's not getting any brighter than currently, so let's just get it out. Well, I can see some yellowing still here, but uh, the rest of it is pretty much back to the original color. So I'm just going to wash this and, yeah, put it back into the case and put it all back together, I guess.
Yeah, definitely a lot better than before. Even though it's not quite back to its original color in this part, but uh, yeah, close enough. It's only the back plate. So one thing I have to do is to just color in this scratch on the Amiga logo with a sharpie. Yeah. Yeah, this looks pretty pretty convincing to me. And as for the repairs, they all this is the the baking soda and super glue one. This is uh, the acetone-based glue one. They all turned out really sturdy. And this is another... This one also got filled with acetone-based stuff. That's, that really welds the plastic together. Um, the downside to that is that you get like um, slight deformation of the plastic. Whereas you can fill the gaps with the baking soda and super glue. Or uh, better still, use a real filler, which is even finer grain I guess. And last but not least the pure super glue which worked well but I've put some excess on here so I have to kind of uh, scrape it away a bit I guess which is not going to be that much of a problem and it's definitely better than before in this spot here. Yeah there we go. Let's scrape it off with a knife. Okay, I guess that'll do. Let's see if you can get the back plate in there. Should sit something like this. Yes, works beautifully. Okay, very nice. Could take some more of this off, but yeah, it's definitely way better than it was when this was all cracked. Cool, so I guess it's time to put it back together. Okay, I was just about to put this back together and I stumbled across this piece which is missing a uh, rubber feet. So I cut, uh, I think this was a coast or a piece of cork, um, just that has the exact correct height. I'm just going to glue that in there as a replacement for now. Nobody's ever going to see this, but I'm still going to paint it with a sharpie. So this is going to have to do. Yeah, which doesn't look bad at all. Okay, let's put this in. Okay, so uh, if you don't look very closely, you can't really tell which one is the replacement foot, I guess. This is a bit darker, but it's going to be... It's going to get a bit lighter with use, I guess. And this is the underside anyway. So um, one nice touch in this case, there's a support in the middle here. Supporting rubber foot in the middle. Very nice. Okay, that was way easier to put in than it was to get it out. So you slide it to the left and you can pick it up. Basically this was just uh, stuck in place, I guess, pretty much. So this goes on here like so. So before I put this memory expansion back in, I just want to have a quick look if I can have a, if I can have a squeeze inside. Oh, look at that. I can. It's just clipped in. <laughs> okay, and that's, that's all there is to it. 464 memory chips. And this is a resistor network, it seems. 
and some capacitors, some more resistors. Should give this a clean, I guess. There's some dust. This equipment complies with the requirements in part 15 of FCC rules for a class A computing device. Operation of this equipment in a residential area may cause unacceptable interference to radio and TV reception requiring the operator to take whatever steps are necessary to correct the interference. Oh yeah! So definitely way better than before. Uh, everything clips in place again on the front here and there's not, not so much play in the case. I am going to do another episode about the keyboard, I guess, because I can't really fit this in this episode. Hope you understand. Um, for now, I just want to kind of test it and see if it actually works. Oh, and you know what? I forgot to plug the drive back in, I guess. <laughs> Ooh, that's bad. Uh, that's kind of what happens when you're too impatient. So, that's the one. This is in, this is in, this is in, everything else is in. Okay, let's just pretend it never happened that I forgot the drive. Let's try this again. Ha, now the drive is reacting. And we have a Kickstart logo. Let's feed it the kickstart disk, which hopefully still works. Yay! Okay. I kind of want to test this, so I'm just going to put my uh, test disk in. So this is a very useful, uh, like, a, like a collection of uh, testing tools that Kier Fraser made. And uh, is, this is open source on his GitHub. Uh, at least it's freely available, I don't know if it's open source, but I guess so. So yeah, let's do all the tests and see if this machine actually does what it's supposed to do. <laughs> we have 0.5 megabyte total memory, 5 megabyte chip memory, uh, 512k chip memory. Let's just push F1 and test all memory. Yeah, it seems to work. It <laughs> goes really fast because, uh, yeah, it doesn't have a lot of memory, obviously. Uh, let's do an audio test. We haven't done any audio testing. I have now uh, have my speakers hooked up. Yep. The CIA chipset and the battery clock. It doesn't have a battery clock. Need the CIA precision timers. Seems to be okay. Okay, so Dennis, who actually gave me this machine, sent me a little package that I'm going to open because it's a very essential part that we are missing so far. If you have been paying attention uh, to this front panel, you might have noticed that there's something missing there. <laughs> and Dennis actually is a masterful 3D printing recreator of uh, old console and computer parts, so he designed me a replacement and uh, meticulously sanded it. Wow, this looks great. <laughs> nice. He actually included some uh, nice sanding 
paper. Very fine stuff that I can use after painting this. This is primed, but this is obviously, this is another color. This is just uh, white primer stuff. But this feels very smooth. Very nice. Going to try to fit this in. And he actually printed these separately, which is um, on the... This came from Thingiverse, I think, the the original files. And he changed the files and actually made them publicly available. And he uh, put these little clips as a separate file, so you can glue them in afterwards. Which he did using the same method that I used with the baking soda and uh, super glue. And obviously there has to be... Wow, this seems to fit just perfectly in this. Let's see. Obviously there has to be another episode. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Oh, I think, maybe... Yeah, I guess without the RAM expansion it would fit. Oh, wow, this is really... Well, in there. Let's see if it fits like this. It should, should. Yeah, kind of, sort of. Actually, I have to um, file these down a tiny little bit. That's where it, where it uh, sticks. There's like these little protruding things in those. Take a tiny little bit. Yeah, now, now it goes in. Okay, so that was the, the problem there. This fits absolutely beautifully. Nice. <laughs> okay, now I only have to get this out again and get the, uh, the memory expansion in there as well. Let's see how well this works. Okay. So I have to file down these parts with the cyanide acrylate, otherwise it fits. Um, maybe I'm just going to lay it flat and just file it down a bit. Okay, that should work better, I guess. Let's see. There we go. Okay, now that fits really tightly and neatly into the case here. Nice. <laughs> okay, now I have to, uh, in the next step, I have to find the right color for this and actually, uh, yeah, match it to the rest of the case. But for now, it doesn't look too bad, actually. Looks good already in white. So I guess that's about all I can do this time. Just going to enjoy the system for a bit. <laughs> and I am going to order some paint and I'm going to take that on in the next episode of this series and also take care of the keyboard, I think. And maybe even talk a bit about uh, possible upgrades of this machine. For now I'm pretty happy about how this turned out. And I hope you liked this video and I hope you found it informative and entertaining maybe. And yeah, I hope to see you again on this channel. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.